present The Copper Beaches, another Sherlock Holmes story adapted for radio by Michael Hardwick. It is pleasant to me to observe, my dear Watson, that in these little records of our cases which you have been good enough to draw up, and I'm bound to say occasionally to embellish, you have given prominence to trivial incidents which have given room for those faculties of deduction and logical synthesis which I have made my own special province. And yet I gather from your tone, Holmes, that I cannot quite hold myself absolved from some charge of sensationalism. You have erred, perhaps, in attempting to color your statements instead of confining yourself to recording that severe reasoning from cause to effect which is the really only notable feature about the thing. Seems to me I've done you full justice. No, I'm not being conceited. If I claim full justice for my art... It is because it is an impersonal thing, a thing beyond myself. Crime is common. Logic is rare. Therefore, it is upon the logic rather than upon the crime that you should dwell. You have degraded what should have been a course of lectures into a series of tales. Well, really, Holmes. At the same time, you can hardly be charged with sensationalism. After all, a fair proportion of these cases in which you've been kind enough to interest yourself do not treat of crime at all. In its legal sense. That singular problem of the man with the twisted lip, for instance. And the incident of the noble bachelor. They were both quite outside the pale of the law. But I fear that in avoiding the sensational, you may have bordered on the trivial. The end may have been so, but I hold that the methods have been novel and full of interest. Ah, my dear Watson... What do the great unobservant public care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction? But if you are trivial, I cannot blame you. Criminal man seems to have lost all enterprise and originality. My own little practice seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving advice to young ladies from boarding school. <laughs> oh, come home. Well, it looks as though I've touched bottom at last. This note I had this morning marks my zero point, I fancy. Here, read it. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Holmes, I am very anxious to consult you as to whether I should or not accept the situation which has been offered to me as a governess. I shall call at half past ten tomorrow if I do not inconvenience you. Yours faithfully, Violet Hunter. Uh, do you know the young lady? Not I. Well, that note was written yesterday, and it's half past ten now. Yes, and I have no doubt that is her ring. Well, let us hope so. But our doubt will very soon be solved, for here, unless I'm mistaken, is the person in question. Miss Violet Hunter. You will excuse my troubling you, I hope, Mr. Holmes. I shall be happy to do anything I can to serve you, Miss Hunter. Pray take a seat. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Dr. Watson? Well, Mr. Holmes, I think I should explain that I, I've had a very strange experience. And as I have no parents or relatives of any sort from whom I could ask advice, I thought that perhaps you would be kind enough to tell me what I should do. A strange experience. I've been a governess for five years, but my employer recently took an appointment abroad, and I found myself without a situation... I advertised and I answered advertisements, but I had no success. Then the little money I'd saved began to run short. I was at my wit's end what to do. Mm, yeah, quite, quite. There's a well-known agency for governesses in the West End called Westaways. I used to call there about once a week. The manager, Miss Stoper, sits in her own little office, and the ladies who are seeking employment wait in an anteroom. They're shown in one by one, and Miss Stoper consults her ledgers and sees whether she has anything to suit them. Well, when I called last week, I was shown into the little office as usual, but I found that Miss Stoper was not alone. Ah, this one will do. I couldn't ask for anything better, Miss Stoper. Capital, capital. Sit down, Miss Hunter, please. This is Mr. Rucastle. Thank you. You're looking for a situation, Miss? 
Yes, sir. As governess? Yes, sir. And what salary do you ask? In my last place with Colonel Spence Monroe, I had four pounds a month. Oh, come, come. Sweating. Rank sweating. How could anyone offer so pitiful a sum to a lady with such attractions and accomplishments? Oh, my accomplishments, sir, may be less than you imagine. A little French, a little German, music and drawing. No, this is all beside the question. The point is, have you the bearing and deportment of a lady? There it is in a nutshell. If you have not, you are not fitted for rearing of a child who may someday play a considerable part in the history of the country. But if you have, why, then how could any gentleman ask you to condescend to accept anything under three figures? Your salary with me, madam, would commence at a hundred pounds a year. Oh! It is also my custom to advance to my young ladies half their salary beforehand, so they may meet any little expenses of the journey and their wardrobe. Ne May I ask where you live, sir? Hampshire, a charming rural place. The Copper Beaches, five miles on the far side of Winchester. It is the dearest old country house. And my, my duty, sir? One child, one dear little romper, just six years old. My sole duties, then, are to take charge of a single child? No, no, not the soul. Not the soul, my dear young lady. Your duty would be, as I am sure your good sense would suggest... To obey any little commands, provided always that they were such as a lady might with propriety obey, which I or my wife might give. Oh, your wife? Oh, I should be happy to make myself useful, of course. Quite so. We are faddy people, you know. Faddy, but kind-hearted. In dress now, for example, if you were asked to wear any dress which we might give you, you would not object to our little whim? Oh, I knew, sir. Or to sit here or sit there. Uh, that would not be offensive to you? Oh, no. Or, or to cut your long hair quite short before you came to us? My hair? Oh, no, sir. Not my hair. I'm afraid that's quite impossible. Well, I'm afraid it's quite essential... It is a little fancy of my wife's. And ladies' fancies, you know, madam, ladies' fancies must be consulted. Uh, so you won't cut your hair? No, sir. I really could not. Oh, very well. Then that quite settles the matter. It's a pity, because in other respects you would really have done very nicely. In that case, Miss Stoper, I'd best inspect a few more of your young ladies. Very well, Mr. Rucastle. Miss Hunter, do you desire your name to be kept upon our books? If you please. Oh, really, it seems rather useless since you refuse the most excellent offers in this fashion. You can hardly expect us to exert ourselves to find another opening for you. Good day, Miss Hunter. Next. Come along now. Well, Mr. Holmes, when I got back to my lodgings and found little enough in the cupboard and two or three bills on the table... I began to ask myself whether I had not done a foolish thing. After all, if these people had strange fads, they were at least ready to pay for their eccentricity. Very few governesses in England are getting a hundred a year. Besides, what use was my hair to me? Oh, it had been considered artistic, but many people are actually improved by wearing it short. By the day after next, I had almost overcome my pride so far as to go back to the agency... And I received this letter from the gentleman himself. Miss Stoper has kindly given me your address, and I write from the Copper Beaches to ask whether you have reconsidered your decision. My wife has been much attracted by my description of you, and is very anxious that you should come. We are willing to give you £120 a year, so as to recompense for any little inconvenience which our fads may cause you. They are not very exacting after all, and your duties with the child are very light. As regards your hair, it is no doubt a pity, especially as I could not help remarking on its beauty during our short interview. But I'm afraid that I must remain firm upon this point. Now do try and come, and I shall meet you with the dog cart at Winchester. Yours faithfully, Jethro Rucastle. That is the letter I've just received, Mr. Holmes, and my mind is made up that I will accept. But I thought that before taking the final step, I, I should like to submit the whole matter to your consideration. Well, Miss Hunter, if your mind is made up, that settles the question. But you would not advise me to refuse? 
I confess it is not the situation which I should like to see a sister of mine apply for. Hey, Watson? What can it all mean, Holmes? I have no data. I cannot tell. Perhaps Miss Hunter has formed some opinion. Well, Mr. Rucastle seemed a kind, good-natured man. Is it not possible that his wife is a lunatic? And that for fear she should be taken to an asylum, he humors her fancies to prevent an outbreak? As matters stand, that is the most probable solution. But in any case, it does not seem a very nice household for a young lady. But the money, Mr. Holmes, the money. The pay is too good. That is what makes me uneasy. There must be some reason... A strong reason for offering 120 pounds when they could have had their pick for 40. I thought if I told you the circumstances, you would understand afterwards if I wanted your help. I should feel so much stronger if I felt that you were at the back of me. Oh, you may carry that feeling away with you. I assure you that your little problem promises to be the most interesting that has come my way for some months. If you should find yourself in doubt or in danger... Danger? What danger do you foresee, Holmes? It would cease to be a danger if we could define it. Well, now that I've spoken to you, I shall write to Mr. Rucastle, sacrifice my poor hair tonight, and start for Winchester tomorrow. Then don't forget, at any time, day or night, a telegram would bring me down to your help. Watson. Watson, listen to this. Please be at Black Swan Hotel, Winchester, midday tomorrow. Do come at my wit's end, Hunter. So, it's taken her just a fortnight to find she needs my help again. I'll look up the trains at once. Will you come with me? I should wish to. Capital. Then I suggest we turn in at once. We shall need to be at our best in the morning. Hmm. Eleven o'clock. Not much further to go. Uh, good. What a change from Baker Street, hey, Holmes? Don't you find the sight of these farmsteads something fresh and beautiful? You know, Watson, it is one of the curses of a mind with a turn like mine that I must look at everything with reference to my own special subject. You look at these scattered houses and you're impressed by their beauty. I look at them... And the only thought that comes to me is a feeling of their isolation. Of the impunity with which crime may be committed there. Oh, good heavens. Who would ever associate crime with these dear old homesteads? They always fill me with a certain horror. It's my belief, Watson, founded upon experience, I may add, that the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. You horrify me, Holmes. Oh, but the reason is very obvious. The pressure of public opinion can do in the town what the law cannot accomplish. There is no lane so vile that the scream of a tortured child doesn't beget some sympathy and indignation among the neighbors. And one word of complaint can set the whole machinery of justice going. Yes, quite true. But look at those lonely houses, each in its own fields. They're filled, for the most part, with poor, ignorant folk who know little of the law. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty. The hidden wickedness which may go on year in, year out in such places, and none the wiser. Had this lady who appeals to us for help gone to live in Winchester, I should never have had a fear for her. It is the five miles of country between that makes the difference. Still, if she can come to Winchester to meet us, she has a freedom. Quite so. What can be the matter, then? Can you suggest no explanation? I have devised seven separate explanations. Each of them would cover the facts as far as we know them. But which of them is correct can only be determined by the fresh information that we shall no doubt find waiting for us at the Black Swan. Ah, and there is the tower of the cathedral. I have promised Mr. Rucastle to be back by three. I got his leave to come into town this morning, though he little knew for what purpose. Pray let us have everything in its due order, Miss Hunter. Well, in the first place... I must say that I have met, on the whole, no actual ill treatment from Mr. and Mrs. Rucastle. But I'm not easy in my mind about them. I can't understand them. What can you not understand? Their reasons for their conduct. Oh, but you shall have it just as it occurred. Darling, Mr. Rucastle met me here and drove me in his dog cart to Copper Beaches. 
I was introduced that evening to his wife and child. I gather that Mr. and Mrs. Rucastle have been married about seven years. He was a widower, and his only child by his first wife was a daughter who is now in Philadelphia. As she couldn't have been less than 20, I can quite imagine that her position must have been uncomfortable with her father's new young wife. Mm. As for Mrs. Rucastle, I now know that there was no truth in our conjecture in your rooms at Baker Street. Uh She is not mad. I found her to be more uh, an entity, as colorless in mind as she is in features. Her husband's kind to her in his boisterous way, but she seems to have some secret sorrow. Uh-huh. The one unpleasant thing about the house which struck me at once was the appearance and manner of the two servants, a man and his wife. Toller, as he's called, is a, a rough, uncouth man with a perpetual smell of drink. His wife is tall and strong and very sour. But fortunately, I spend most of my time in the nursery or in my own room. And that is the entire household? Yes. Oh, except for Carlo. Carlo? Mr. Rucastle introduced me to him on my first evening there. Here we are, Miss Hunter. Can you see him? Don't be frightened. It's only Carlo, my mastiff. I call him mine, but really old Toller is the only one who can do anything with him. Down, Carlo! Down, you brute! Down! We feed him once a day, and not too much then, so he's always keen as mustard. Toller lets him loose every night, and heaven help the trespasser he lays his fangs into... Oh, oh, and for goodness sake, Miss Hunter, don't you ever on any pretext set your foot over the threshold at night. It's as much as your life is worth if you do. A very direct warning, and no idle one, I fancy. But pray, Miss Hunter, continue your narrative. For two days after my arrival, my life was very quiet. On the third, Mrs. Rucastle came down just after breakfast and whispered in her husband's ear. Uh, Oh, ah, yes, to be sure. Uh, Miss Hunter, my wife reminds me to say how much we are obliged to you for falling in with our whims so far as to cut your hair. And the effect is charming, my dear. It is nice of you to say so. I assure you it has not detracted in the tiniest iota from your appearance. And now uh, we shall see how a change of dress will become you. If you will kindly go up to your room, you will find one laid out ready on your bed. It belongs to my dear daughter, Alice, who's now in Philadelphia. It should fit you very well. Charming. Simply charming. Might have been made to measure, eh, my dear? A perfect fit. I was surprised how well it suited me. Perfect. Now, Miss Hunter, be good enough to take the chair over there. The one with its back to the center window. (laughs) Splendid. Now then, my dear, uh, let us stay and talk with Miss Hunter for a little while, shall we? And they stayed there talking for about an hour, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Rucastle told some extremely funny stories. So funny that I laughed till I was tired. The odd thing was, though, that Mrs. Rucastle never so much as smiled at them. Then her husband suddenly remarked that I might change my dress and go about my daily duties. Well, two days later... The same thing happened. When he had me laughing helplessly at his stories for a while, my employer handed me a yellow-backed novel, moved my chair slightly to one side, and asked me to read to him. I read for about ten minutes, and then suddenly, in the middle of a sentence, he ordered me to stop and go and change my dress. I hope, Mr. Holmes, you don't find my story too protracted. I'm glad of the full details. Whether they seem to you relevant or not. I shall try not to miss anything of importance. Well, you can imagine how curious I became as to the meaning of this extraordinary performance. For one thing, I noticed that they were always very careful to turn my face away from the window. I became consumed with the desire to see what was going on behind my back. Then a happy thought seized me. My hand mirror had been broken, and I concealed a little of the glass in my handkerchief. 
On the next occasion, in the midst of the laughter, I put my handkerchief up to my eyes and was able, with a little management, to see all that was behind me. And what was that? There was a man standing outside in the Southampton Road. He was small and he had a beard. There were several others, but this one appeared to be looking earnestly in my direction. However, when I lowered my handkerchief, I found Mrs. Rucastle's eyes also fixed on me. She said nothing, but I'm convinced that she knew I had a mirror in my hand. She rose at once. Jethro, my dear, there is an impertinent fellow out on the road who is staring up at Miss Hunter. Really? A friend of Miss Hunter's, no doubt. I know no one in these parts, sir. Dear me, how very impertinent, then. Kindly turn round and wave him away, uh, like that. Oh, surely it would be better to take no notice. No, no. We should have him loitering here always. Exactly. Kindly turn round, Miss Hunter, and motion him to go away. Very well, sir. Is that all you have to tell us, Miss Hunter? Almost all, Mr. Holmes. Only now I must tell you of the final experience which made my mind up to telegraph you. I had noticed that one wing of the Copper Beaches appeared to be quite uninhabited. When I mentioned this to Mr. Rucastle, he told me rather abruptly that his hobby is photography and that he keeps his dark room and things there. Well, call it curiosity or woman's instinct, but from that moment I sensed that there was something about that suite of rooms that I was not to know. As a result, when I saw Tala come out of that wing yesterday and forget to take the key out of the door, I slipped in quickly. I found a little passage with three doors in a line. Two of them were open. The center one was closed and sealed with an iron bar and padlock. As I stood there, I suddenly saw a shadow pass backwards and forwards against the little slit of dim light from under the door. There was somebody inside. My nerves failed me suddenly. Without reasoning, I turned and ran straight into the arms of Mr. Ruka. Ah, so it was you then. What? I thought it must be, but I saw the door open. Oh, I'm so frightened. And what has frightened you, my dear young lady? It's so, so dreadfully still in here. It's so lonely and eerie. Only that. Why? What did you think? Why do you imagine I locked the door to this wing? I'm sure I don't know, sir. It's to keep people out who have no business here. Do you see now? I'm sure if I had known, I... Well, you know now. And if you ever put your foot over that threshold again, I'll throw you to the mastiff. Remember that, miss. After that, I suppose I could have fled the house. But I must confess my curiosity remained as strong as my fears. By the time I had sent you a wire, Mr. Holmes, I felt much easier... I had no difficulty getting leave to come here this morning, but I must get back by three. Mr. and Mrs. Rucastle are going on a visit early this evening, and I have to look after the child. That is well. What about Toller and his wife? I heard his wife tell Mrs. Rucastle he drunk himself into incapability. She can do nothing with him. Capital. Now, is there a cellar with a good strong lock? Yes, the wine cellar. You seem to have acted all through this matter like a brave and sensible girl, Miss Hunter. Do you think you could perform one more feat? Oh, I will try. Dr. Watson and I will be at the Copper Beaches by 7 o'clock. The Rue Castles will be out by then. Yes. And Toller should still be incapable. There only remains Mrs. Toller. If you could send her into the cellar on some errand and then turn the key on her, you would facilitate matters immensely. I will do it. Excellent. Now, Watson. Yes, Holmes. I trust you have your revolver. There is only one feasible explanation for this business. And it is clear that we are dealing with a cunning man. I have it. Then, Miss Hunter, we shall meet you at the Copper Beaches at seven o'clock. You've managed it? Yes. That's Mrs. Toller thumping to be let out. Toller is snoring on the kitchen rug. Yeah, here are his keys. Well done. Uh, now, lead the way and we shall soon see the end of this black business. Uh, This is the locked room. None of these keys seem to fit the lock. There's no sound from inside. I trust we're not too late. Now, Watson, let's have the aid of your shoulder and we shall see. Uh, 
There's no one here. Yes, beauty has guessed Miss Hunter's intentions and carried his victim off. But how? Through that skylight. We shall soon see how he managed it. Ah. Yes, I can see the end of a ladder against the eaves. But why should he need to? Ah. I tell you, he is a clever and dangerous man. Holmes, someone's coming. I think, Watson, it'll be as well for you to have your pistol ready. Oh! No, I caught you, have I? Villain, where's your daughter? It's for me to ask you that, you thieves, spies and thieves. Thieves? But you're in my power. I'll serve you. He's gone for the door. I have my revolver. We'd better get downstairs and close the door. Wait a minute. Great heaven! It's got him! Quickly, Watson! Stay there, Miss Hunter! They're in there! Right! Let me pass! Good shooting, Watson. I'll accompany Miss Hunter to bring up Mrs. Toller while you attend to this mangled wretch here. Well, he'll live at any rate. Then let us sit down and hear what Mrs. Toller has to tell us. It's clear to me that she knows more about this matter than anyone else. I'd have done so before now if I could have got out of that cellar. Oh, miss. Oh, it's a pity I didn't know what you was planning. I could have told you you were wasting your time. How could I know? Pray, Mrs. Toller, let us hear it. There are several points on which I must confess I'm still in the dark. She was never happy at home, wasn't Miss Alice, after he married again. You refer to Rue Castle's daughter? Yes, sir. She wasn't happy, but things never got real bad for her till she took up with Mr. Fowler. Mr. Fowler? A, a seafaring gentleman she met at a friend's house. And Rue Castle objected to the association. It wasn't just that, sir. You see, Miss Alice had a lot of money of her own by her mother's will. When there seemed to be a chance of her husband coming forward, Mr. Rue Castle wanted her to sign a paper giving him control of the money whether she married or not. When she wouldn't, he kept at her so much that she... Well, she talked about running away. Ah. Then I think I can deduce all that remains. Now, Rue Castle, I presume, took to this system of imprisonment. Yes, sir. Do you mean that Alice never went to Philadelphia? That Mr. Rue Castle kept her locked in that room? And had the ingenious idea of bringing you down from London to impersonate her. To give the watching Mr. Fowler the impression that she no longer wished to encourage him. The laughter on these occasions was to convey the appearance that she remained in good spirits and was under no compulsion of restraint. But that's just it, sir. Incredible. So now you see, Miss Hunter, what manner of role you have been playing. Oh, I can scarcely believe it. But then, where is Alice now? No doubt Mrs. Toller can enlighten us again. I presume, however, that Mr. Fowler, being as persevering as a good seaman should be, succeeded by certain arguments, metallic or otherwise, in convincing that lady that her interests were the same as his. Mr. Fowler was a very kind-spoken, free-handed gentleman. Precisely. And in this way, he managed that your good man should have no want of drink. And then the ladder should be ready at the moment when your master had gone out. That's just as it happened, sir. But, unfortunately for himself, as it transpired, Rue Castle suspected something and came back. Like us, he was too late for his daughter. As for what happened instead... Though, he did brief a board Watson. Here comes a lady I presume to be Mrs. Rue Castle with what I take to be the country surgeon. Ah, locus standi now is rather a questionable one. I think we had better make our way to Winchester and say goodbye to the Copper Beaches forever.
That was The Copper Beaches, another dramatized Sherlock Holmes story. As Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, you heard Robert Langford and Kenneth Baker. Others in the cast were Sheila Holliday, Fiona Fraser, John Hayter, and Elaine Lee, with production by Adrian Steed. <laughs>